Yeah, so thank you for allowing me this opportunity to talk about parasites. I try to keep it simple because I didn't want to go in too much details, but hopefully it will be interesting enough for everyone to, uh, well, to look at. So before talking about parasitism, we should very first try to define what parasitism is. There are various definitions, but the easiest one is that one individual, the parasite, derives a benefit from another organism, which is then damaged in some way. It's usually not killed, but it can be very stressful for the host. And usually it also involves a long-term association. So the parasite lives inside of the host. And this is what's shown in this cartoon. I wanted to save you from gruesome pictures of parasites. So I thought I take this romantic picture, maybe too much romantic. So it's basically two tapeworms which are traveling in a love boat in the bowels of a vertebrate. And um, that defines the parasites. But maybe you are more interested to know what kind of parasites there are. You might be familiar with some of them. So some parasites are ectoparasites. They mean they are attaching outside on the host. I guess some of those might look familiar to you, like mites, louse. The other ones maybe not so, but we will go into it in more detail. And the other ones might be familiar also to you, to some of you at least, who have dogs or pets, who have sometimes eggs, hopefully not, but can happen, eggs of these parasites in uh, some kind of um, excrements, I would say. There are all kinds of different, although in the old days, in the days of Darwin, all these parasites were often considered worms and all treated together. Now we know that they all belong to different phyla, so different groups, very different groups, although they look to some degree similar because they have adapted to various similar um, situations to live inside of their hosts. So I'm here talking about parasites, but the question is why? Why should we care about parasites? We would rather not think about them, maybe we would like to erase them from our memory, but they are there, yes. So just to say that depending on estimates, some uh, authors say that about 50, maybe it's slightly less, of organisms have at least a parasitic stage in their life cycle. Yes, and they are scattered all over the tree of life. This is what this circle is showing. It's basically the tree of life. Some are uh, bacteria, others are uh, animals, and so on. Also, plants can be parasitic. Another thing is also, that's why this uh, parasite superhero is shown here, right? So every organism, as far as it has been studied or has been observed, has at one point, or at least some specimens of these species have been observed to be associated with parasites. So basically, we are all affected by parasites. Yeah? So that's something we should know. The last thing is, with parasites, is that we want to know what's going to happen. Maybe you think about parasite and you see the connection with disease, and we would like to know what will happen, for example, with climate change, with diseases. What will happen when more people come together at the same place? What will happen when there is a lot of travel and people take parasites? So that's all things we would like to know. And that's why usually we rely a lot on data which is collected today. So basically from the globe and we observe different parasites, uh, people or animals, they are brought in and basically you find these parasites. So there's a quite a good understanding where these parasites are, although there are still areas where we don't know so little about them, right? But they are used actually to predict what's going to happen, for example, in the future. The problem with these models is yeah, that um, they are only taking data from today, and so it's just a snapshot we are using to predict the future, uh, which is on the one hand good, we have a lot of data, but we are not looking at experiments which have happened in the past. So basically, uh, all the evolution the parasites have been through and also observations we actually can make, right? And we need those together with the modern data to make predictions. So parasites, that's why I said underdogs, they have a bad reputation. We think about disease, we also think about ourselves, we don't want to be associated with parasites. Also in evolutionary science, right, um, we haven't, uh, well, we, do, we, we rarely consider them because they are maybe further away from us, right, um, or at least from vertebrates. And me as a paleontologist, it's very rare to find someone who talk about parasites because 
If you read the literature, even today, it's often written parasite fossil record. There are no fossils of fossil, almost none of parasites, which is, I will hope to show you now, untrue, because there is some. So for all these reasons, yeah, we often infer everything we know about parasites from their hosts. Yeah, so we, their distribution, how things will change, we observe to the glasses of the host. So we think as ourselves, okay, I have a parasite, my, my pet has a parasite. At this place we have a parasite, and then we try to make predictions from that, seeing to the glasses of the vertebrate or the host. Yeah? But then the problem is we don't really look at the parasites themselves. Right? And if we want to know something about evolution, then it becomes a bit difficult because we think we know, but actually it's not really true because we are actually using a kind of metaphor or we are just looking at um, the host instead of looking at the parasites, which will happen with them. So this is what this target is uh, demonstrating. So we think we know very precisely what's going on, but actually we are likely off, hopefully not too way off, because we are only relying on mostly on the information from the host or from the perspective of the host. So then the question is, parasites are also very popular in pop culture, of course. Aliens are supposedly also parasites. Um, and this is, looks like, uh, well, a dangerous situation. So is it really dangerous for me as a paleontologist to work with parasite? Is the fossil record really that bad than we would like to think? And I will say something maybe provocative, um, and I will say no, yes. Because I have been showing all these parasites before, uh, as you might remember, but they are not modern parasites, although they might look like modern parasites, they are related to modern parasites, but these are all reconstructions, nice drawings of remains which actually are fossil parasites. And some can go back a long time. So uh, as a geologist or a paleontologist, we often lose the abbreviation MA, which is millions of years. And you can see that some of them, um, for example, yeah, I don't know if this will work, yes, uh, so this one here is almost 500 million years old, this remains, dated that, so it's very old. It's a pentostomate, and I will go into it again. And also this, uh, this tick here, which is actually a female, which could identify it in uh, amber, it was filled with uh, actually blood, and it was associated with remains of dinosaurs. So also dinosaurs already had um, ticks. There is various other situations so uh, where you can say, okay, so this is maybe a better thing than clicking on the computer. Um, so I will not be able to tell about all these different parasites. If you're interested, my, uh, you can con come to me afterwards or also look at my or write me an email and I'm happy to answer all your questions. But I will give some examples here. So the first one is this strange creature. It looks a bit like something from an alien movie, but it's actually a pantostomid. Yeah, it's, um, in the beginning, they were sometimes treated with helminths because um, worms, but actually we now know, as you will see later, that they are actually arthropods. So they are derived arthropods. So they have lost some of their morphology to look like a worm, but actually they are arthropods which have lost their limbs. And these, all these ones are fossil ones, which are almost 500 million years old. So really old. Yeah. So to go back to this underdog, so this was a bit of the issue. So at one point, all these helminths, so everything which looked like a worm was treated together as one big group, although they aren't closely related necessarily. So they are independent lineages, which um, developed a quite similar morphology. And these ones are these arthropods. There was even a time that these pentostomids were treated as a separate uh, phylum in the animal kingdom. They are no longer. They are just in arthropods, which is, well, where all the lice and the ticks and all the other, uh, some of the other uh, parasites I've shown about. So then we come to the next point, uh, which I wanted to make. And that's um, this association with the host. So often we think Parasites are very specialized on their host. So basically you can use the host as a kind of predictor what is going to happen with the parasite. Even in the past, this might be possible because we know that, for example, this is about 400 million years old. This is a remain of a nematode, which is associated with a plant, which are all the same group today is also associated with plants. So, okay, this association seems to be conserved to some degree, at least for 400 million years. 
Similar with these two, so these lice, they are bird lice, yeah, and this one is actually a reconstruction of a fossil one, which was living about 35 million years ago, and already in its crop it has feather remains, so it was already uh, associated with birds, like today. And this is my favorite, I have worked a little bit on this, uh, this is a tapeworm, so it's a helminth, a platy helminth to be more correct, and it was found in the poop of a fossil shark. Yeah. And uh, it means also today this group is in fossil sharks. So, okay, so we think so far so good. Maybe we don't need, well, I hope we do need, but we don't need the fossils of, of these. But if we go deeper, then we, it becomes problematic because various of these other remains I was showing, so this is an uh, It's a, it belongs in rotifers, it's another animal phylum. These are nematodes, um, remains of a nematode. This is the tick I was already telling about. This is the pentastomate I saw before, and they are associated or were associated with uh, these two with dinosaurs. So they were found in poop or in uh, associated with feathers of dinosaurs. So they were already there, but of course they are no longer dinosaurs. One might argue, okay, birds, they come or they are closely related with, with dinosaurs or come from a particular lineage in dinosaurs. So maybe they are not extinct, but these dinosaurs, they are associated with, they are extinct. So these associations were extinct. So we can't, so there are changes in host associations. So we must be very uh, careful if we want to use them. The same with this, this acantocephalon, it was found in crocodiles. So one might say, okay, well, crocodiles are still alive today. That's true. But this group is no longer in coprolites, or at least not as a final host. So that's normally not the case anymore. The most, uh, well, Another favorite of mine, maybe I have too much favorites, right? This is this one, this pentostomid, because this one is today only associated with vertebrates which are breeding with lungs, right? They are usually infesting this part. But this one is coming from almost 500 million years ago. So at that point, there were no lung breeding vertebrates, not yet. So there were vertebrates, but no lung breeding vertebrates, and they were all marine. So this one is also found in the marine realm. So it has been argued that it has a, an association as a parasite with, because it has all the morphological adaptations or already the specializations to be a parasite, but its host is not around at that point. So it must have come from a different host. So to set this a bit straight, right, we can maybe, I don't say we, we have to not think about the modern data. I think the best way is to combine all the data in the best possible way. So if we do that, right, then we can also use the molecular record, which is very vast, and we can actually use these um, instances of parasite fossils to calibrate their tree and their evolutionary relationships. And then we can get much further. I've been doing a lot of that. I won't go into detail about this today. And we get much further. So it looks then that we know less than we knew before, if we would rely on the, on the hosts, because this is what we would like to know, and you see, okay, the data is suggesting there is a quite, it's quite a lot of uncertainty, seemingly, about this. But at least we know that the truth is in these estimates, it's not outside, right? So we are closer to the truth than we were before if we open our minds, so to say. Then the question is, of course, okay, that's all good and well, but can we say anything at all? Because we would like to, of course, use this data to predict what's going to happen in the future, what happened in the past, to better understand the evolution of the parasites. How can we do that? Because we can't do it with these isolated findings, where we can do a lot of wit, but it's still not enough to go really into the detail. And we would like to know, of course, were there past events of climate change where there were rapid changes in parasites or host associations? Were there maybe extinction events where the dinosaurs were uh, going extinct? Did they have a large impact on the parasites? And for this, we need to look at something else. And these are basically fossils, right? Not necessarily directly of the parasite, but still a good indicator of these particular parasites. And there are two kinds, which I will hope to say a little bit about. One are pathologies. So you can imagine some parasites cause disease. And this is reflected also in the skeleton of the host. So if we find more, the, the skeletons of the host, you find more common than the parasites themselves. So if you find a disease in the skeleton, you have a quite a good record or a better record of the changes of the diseases in the fossil record. 
And the other thing is, of course, what I've shown also before, is if you go with your pet, for example, usually what you do is you check this tool. So you check the excrements of your dog for parasites. Of course, we can also do that in the past. It's something which is often ignored, which are coprolites. So basically fossilized poop, right? And you find them in masses, I would say, and people usually just ignore them because they think, well, what am I going to do with fossilized poop? Shall I put it in my living room? Shall I do something else with it? But you can actually use it scientifically, right? So maybe the first thing where I'm most familiar with are pathologies. So I will show some examples from a publication we made. Um, so here, there is this uh, swelling you can see. It's basically an isopod, which is in this, um, this crab here, which is actually this bulge, which is quite characteristic for an isopod. And they go back also to about 200 million years. There is this uh, gastropod, which sits on top of a, of a crinoid, which actually is boring inside and taking uh, food. Then there is this clam or bivalve, right? And uh, there you can see these traces, these strange pits, which are caused by larvae of helminths, which are actually inside. And in the fossil record, there is much more shells uh, of, for example, bivalves than there are dinosaur bones. So <laughs> no offense for the dinosaurs, but there's much more data to be had. Same with this here, where there is a, a worm. I don't know if you can see it so well. There is a because of the black background, there is this worm trace, and also these worms are ectoparasites, which are in a brachiopod from 500 million years ago. So we did that, actually. We published a publication on that with a very rough estimate of what's going on, and we can actually demonstrate that in a million years, that actually with the diversity of the hosts uh, increasing, also the parasite record is increasing relatively to today. So this is today, we are somewhere around here, um, this is dropping off, but this is slightly confusing because we are only looking at fossils here. So we didn't include the fossil data to not compare dif different data sets, which is actually the goal to, to advance ourselves. And you see there is also a major drop in the uh, parasitic associations around this point, this line less so, which are extinction events. So there's times where a lot of species went extinct. Almost um, here up to 90% has been estimated in the Permian mass extinction, and less so when the dinosaurs went extinct at this time. So there is also a small dip here, but it's maybe not so well possible. So at least we can say there is this relationship also with biodiversity and um, also this um, yeah, diseases which are taken from skeletal pathologies. The same is here. We also know that even if we don't all have all the parasites, there is this strange uh, gastropod here or this snail snail here, which is sitting on the crinoid, and there are observations in the entire Paleozoic. But we don't have these snails anymore today. They went extinct at the Permian mass extinction, and also these associations went extinct at that time. So we know in the past that some associations of parasites went extinct, others evolved. So that is something we need to take into our models, even if we want to go to the future. So we found support for these two things. One is parasitic interactions have increased through time, through the Phanerozoic, who would say, as a geologist, which is the entire time frame, and also an association between host diversity and parasitic interactions. Yes, we did a lot of quantitative analysis of this. Uh, um, I decided not to show this today, but if somebody's really like deeply interested, I'm happy to share the paper and all the other things which are associated with it. But it's a bit difficult to fit that all in this presentation. So the reason I'm here is because, um, although I speak English and I'm still learning Polish, uh, actually um, I'm here. So since last month I started uh, my uh, position here and my project here, which is called the Paradive Project, where we're actually co collecting more data on these parasites of the past and combining it and using it actually to make predictions also about the future. So how does that work? Basically we have a team, which is the Paradive team. I will introduce them uh, later in, in the next slide. And also we want to have all the general public involved. So we will try, or we are work also on developing an app to have everyone involved in collecting data for us, or maybe if the, in, at least the people who are interested. Also the globe, scientists around the world. And also the plan is to also organize workshops here in Warsaw, but also, uh, or in general, so people can also join maybe electronically um, to these workshops where we work on this kind of data. 
So the plan is to develop an app, although we are still struggling a bit how to develop that app because I don't know, uh, it's nice to have an app or, or to have Spotify and listen to music on your, but how do you bring people to collect data on parasites? But still, I think that's something we, we need to do or it would be nice to do. It would save me a lifetime of work and maybe multiple lifetimes of work to get at this stage. The other thing is also involving museums and places all over the world actually to build a large online database of all these interactions, which now is just scattered in the literature. I am well quite familiar with the literature, but uh, even for me, each time I find new data still. So, and this is what the Paradise uh, project will try to achieve. Uh, it's a bit, maybe a bit uh, a high goal. So I hope we will reach many of those, or at least try to get closer to that goal. And this is the fossilized poop I promised. So. <laughs> This, I was talking a lot about these uh, diseases, these uh, pathologies, but of course there is also this remains. So these are two, uh, are two examples. One kind is a shark. You might, might seem like a shark. It's a, it's a paleozoic shark. And this is uh, a cynodont, which is on the lineage towards uh, mammals. Yes, and these uh, poop here looks interesting. It doesn't look, well, at least it's dry and it's <laughs> mineralized. So you could put it in your living room if you felt like it. And if you actually start dissolving it or cutting it, you actually will find there are eggs inside. So there were eggs of these tapeworms here, which even were still developing inside of this uh, shark coprolite. And there were also these eggs of ascariot nematodes inside of the cenodont, which is about, I think, 260 million years old here. And this is about uh, 350 million years, or 300 at least years old. So that's good. So I hope now I can manage to convince you that there is more in the fossil record at least than nothing, right? Then the thing is, why should we still care or how will this help us now to predict what's going to happen in the future? Exactly this, because now we have a very good snapshot of the diversity of parasites and their associations with hosts today, even the distribution worldwide. But nothing or we have maybe a couple of hundred years where we're going to go back in historical data, but that's it. So we have like a 3D snapshot of the entire thing, but we would like to know more. We would like to go in the future. So this means we don't want 3D, we want 4D. Yeah, we want the time aspect inside. So we can do that actually because we have actually remains of these particular species of parasites, which are fossil or subfossil. So 10,000s of year old remains can be found worldwide, actually, of these two species of parasites, which are causing diseases. And we can look how did they respond to climatic changes or uh, shifts or uh, changes, migrations of the humans at that point. There is various things which have happened at that time because there was, of course, also, for example, the colonization of, of the Americas, for example which has in our data a large impact actually on the distribution of the parasites. So that's it for today. I'm happy to talk more about parasites. I'm maybe too much happy to talk more about parasites, but this is the team. So um, it's me, of course, in the parasite team. And these are two, uh, Alexandra Skarina and also Veronika Vashka. She, they will be starting next month actually to work on this project. And uh, I also wanted to include in our team uh, also this one's the parasites themselves because they are an important component of it, right? And so with this big uh, project that we got. So I hope that um, for some questions. This is a picture of a tapeworm, <laughs> which looks also, I try to steer away from gruesome pictures. So I, uh, this is an SEM picture, which has been artificially uh, colored, actually. I think it's not my picture. It's a, won a prize, actually. You can find it online, actually, this one. Yeah, so thank you for your attention. Yeah.